Marina said he's taking me. We're going to, we'll get you down to the 20. Oh, he says that to everybody. <laughs> I'm going to try to get the few judges that are up from air retention down there <laughs> as often as I can. Um, I got a, I got a, a letter from one of the judges in Lee that I had worked with on the circuit bench said, my elevation to the second district made both courts smarter. <laughs> Well, they, they got credit. So, I, you know, Smile said thank you very much. <laughs> They're a great, gr great group, um, great group of people, great group of lawyers, and I don't think anything as that has changed over the last 20 years. I think we have so much for my reminiscing. I think we have everyone on this case. Mr. Belcher, my understanding is you are counsel on behalf of the appellant, and did you wish to reserve any that time is, for rebuttal? I wish to reserve seven minutes, Your Honor. Honor. Well, we have a nice little rule buried in our uh, operations manual that says the max I can do is five. So how does that work? Five will do it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and may it please the court. I'm Gus Belcher, and I represent Dr. Albert Evans in this case. This is an appeal from a final order of the Florida Board of Optometry which adopted a recommended order from an administrative law judge after an evidentiary hearing. We have raised two issues for the court's consideration. The first of which is that count one of the first amended administrative complaint did not provide reasonable notice to Dr. Evans of the facts and conduct that warranted discipline against his license to practice optometry in Florida. Can I stop you on the sufficiency of the complaint? Yes, if, Your Honor. If I understood your argument, you essentially contend that the department was required to plead to the fraud standard for a civil fraud claim. Am I misapprehending your argument? Well, I, I'm not, I don't think I would go that far. I think that I was analogizing to the fraud standard in civil cases. Obviously, this is not a civil case. Uh, but my argument was if, if reasonable notice of the facts and conduct warranting disciplinary action are required under Chapter 120, and we're talking about uh, fraudulent, misleading, deceptive advertising, that that should be specifically stated. And it's um, your position uh, that the complaint doesn't put the optician on notice that the ad was misleading and that the patient was misled? Uh, on, the, on the specific findings against him, yes, that is our position because the ultimate finding by the administrative law judge was that Dr. Evans' uh, advertisement that he had run for 13 years, which advertised a free eye exam for glasses, created the false impression that the free eye exam for glasses came with a free eyeglasses prescription. And the basis of our argument, Your well, and, Honor, and, and is, he wasn't going, the patient wasn't going to get a free prescription, right? Well, our contention is the patient was going to get a free prescription, not under the free eye exam for glasses, because this particular patient, his eyes were not examined under the free eye exam for glasses off. Could he have gotten a prescription was, for glasses after he had the free, if he had just had the free eye exam, could he have gotten a prescription for eyeglasses? Well, no. The short answer is no. And I would have to refer to, uh, I believe it's page 539 in the record. That is a, uh, it's an intake form. It was referred to variously at the evidentiary hearing as the encounter form, or I think Dr. Evans put it, how, you, how are you going to pay for it? And it had different options for eye exams. One of the options was the free eye exam for glasses. And the language on that 
specific section on the form said that the free eye exam for glasses does not come with a prescription. And was that now, form this part of back, the ad? No, the form was not part of the ad, but I'll also add before I go on about this option on the encounter form, that the free eye exam for glasses advertisement itself doesn't even mention a prescription one way or the other. Well, what did it the doesn't say the anything exam for glasses? What was that? How is that supposed to be understood? By the public? well, by the public, well, uh, the people, free eye whoever exam. was the intended audience for the ad, what does free eye exam for glasses? What's that supposed to mean? Well, I, on free this record, for... I don't know. That's a free eye exam to see whether or not you need glasses, I could say, but there's nothing in the record on that because that's not how Dr. Evans defended this case based on the allegations. The allegations in count one of the admitted administrative complaint are that this patient saw the advertisement for a free eye exam for glasses went to one price optical, that was Dr. Evans' uh, store and uh, optometrist practice. Uh, the patient uh, had it, his eyes examined um, and afterwards he was told he had to pay $39 before he could have a prescription. That's what Dr. Evans defended. And the evidence he presented at the hearing was that this patient uh, proceeded under a vision plan that was attached to his Medicare uh, Advantage plan. I think then we get into a whole nother factual part of this that I, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, the fact that part of what was in the complaint, if I read it correctly, is that your client also billed uh, under codes for which reimbursement would not otherwise have been available. And that was part of the basis of the complaint. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Well, and I'll ask, a, I'm sorry to ask you a question, Your Honor, but are you talking about the attempt to bill for dilation or the comprehensive eye exam? There were two billings or both. I both. can talk about both. I, I'd like you to All address right. both. All right. The, the billing for uh, what Dr. Evans uh, thought was dilation using the CPT code, which is the medical shorthand that's used for billing purposes, he inserted a code 92019. And Dr. Evans' testimony was that optometrists pretty much have to teach themselves how to bill and code. There are no continuing education classes on how to bill and code division plans. So he had some tutors, some mentors, and he was also self-taught. And he began uh, billing and coding to vision plans in 2005. And he went through some, some statistics about how many times he had billed. But specifically, 92019 uh, under regular medical CPT coding terminology means uh, an ophthalmologic examination under general anesthesia. Obviously, an optometrist is not going to be conducting that type of examination. Uh, and uh, Respondents Exhibit 1 at the hearing was an example of a vision plan, not the one that was involved with this particular patient, but a different vision plan, which considered 92019 to denote dilation. So not let's talk about example. the other, I, I think I understand you on the dilation code. Let's talk about the other code, that uh, the 92004 Com code, which I think your client admits to willfully submitting a claim on a third party to a third party payer for that service, which wasn't provided. He did, you are correct, he did. The record contains that admission. Um, I, I will talk about uh, what he stated surrounding that statement. And that is, this was the first time uh, 
that he could recall that he had a patient who, after receiving the dilation drops in the patient's eyes, left and just decided not to come back. So uh, under Dr. Evans' view of things at that time, um, it was not necessary to absolutely conduct an examination of the dilated eyes to complete the checklist for the different tasks that are required under Florida law for a comprehensive eye examination. So there was some uncertainty. And that was uh, one of from the things in that part of this encounter or activity with this optician, that submission of the 92004 code that he knew and willfully submitted without having performed the exam was also part of what went into the ALJ's determination on this license action, correct? Well, it, it did go into that determination, yes. Uh, but again, moving back to the first amended administrative complaint, that did not excuse the Department of Health from alleging specifically what the problem with the advertisement because well, I think those are two different things, aren't they? I mean, I oh, think they the, are two different. The complaint things. alleged both. You had a two-count complaint that focused part one on the ad and part two on the coding issues, and your client's explanation for the nine two zero four code was basically the guy walked in for his free eye exam. We gave a service that we, we felt was chargeable, and so the fact that he walked out made it okay for the bill to be submitted as a comprehensive eye exam. That's the way I understood it. Well, I would respectfully disagree with that view of what Dr. Evans testified to. What I, my recollection is he testified that as he went through the various uh, items that are required for a comprehensive eye examination, uh, I believe the only element that was missing was examination of the uh, dilated eye. In fact, when Dr. Evans released this patient into the store to allow the dilation drops to take effect, Dr. Evans was writing the eyeglasses prescription then. So in Dr. Evans' view, he had conducted a comprehensive eye examination. At least that's that's my view of his testimony. I, I don't think that Dr. Evans ever explicitly said, hey, I knew I didn't conduct a comprehensive, but I billed for it. He said he billed, he did agree, he billed for services not rent. And the, at least the record showed that if I'm reading the ALJ's order right, there is a code for an intermediate exam. I think Dr. Evans' quandary was there wasn't a sort of a half measure. He wasn't aware of a half measure code. But it That's looks correct. like the states, the Department of Health's expert identified the closest thing to sort of a half measure code for an intermediate exam. And I guess your client's position on that is that opticians are not perhaps as educated as other healthcare providers might be with regard to CPT codes. Well, uh, optometrists do not have, as Dr. Evans testified, and I think it was unrebutted, uh, there are no continuing uh, optometric education classes on billing. It's well, something that I, they, when you that undertake they to, to bill Medicare, though, uh, any medical provider that's going to bill Medicare, uh, if I'm not mistaken, part of that process involves attesting to Medicare that what is being billed is what was what the provider did, and your client surely knew that. Oh, he did. There are continuing education programs for optometrists for Medicare billing. But as he testified, Medicare billing and vision plan billing are different sometimes. Uh, the biggest example of that is uh, the use of code 92019. Could be dilation to some vision plans, but obviously to others, it's an examination under general anesthesia, which an optometrist can't do. Have I answered your 
the question that you had, Your Honor? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, continuing on with the, the first issue, and that is the notice issue from the first amended administrative complaint. Uh, as I said before, what was essential, what was alleged in the first amended administrative complaint count one was that the patient saw the ad, he came in, he received an eye examination, and then he was told he had to pay $39 uh, for a prescription. The problem with that sufficing as uh, notice that the free eye exam for glasses ad was deceptive because it created the false impression that a free eyeglasses prescription came with it is that on the encounter sheet uh, under the free eye exam for glasses option, the, the cost back in 2012 for an eyeglasses prescription was $48. The $39 that's alleged in the first amended administrative complaint was a dilation fee that Dr. Evans customarily charged to uh, patients who had a vision plan. Because Mr. Belcher, I'm required to let you know you're at 15. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll uh, reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Council Hodges, we are ready for uh, your response. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Sarah Ann Hodges, and I represent the Department of Health in this matter. The department asks that this court affirm the final order below for two reasons. First, the department gave the appellant reasonable notice of the facts that supported the disciplinary violations that were brought against him. And second, the administrative law judge did not impermissibly stack inferences. And even if she had done so, any error was harmless. As to the first argument, section 120.60 subsection 5 provides that an administrative complaint must give reasonable notice to the licensee of the facts that warrant the charges brought. In cases involving questions of where an agency failed to give reasonable notice, the agency failed to list any factual circumstances that gave rise to the violations. That is not the case here. Here, the administrative complaint alleged that despite an advertisement claiming that eye examinations for glasses would be free, a patient who sought that exam was then charged a $39 dilation fee. Based upon these specific facts, the department charged the appellant with false or deceptive advertising, as it is clear that despite offering a free eye examination, one was not provided. There is no doubt that the appellant knew what facts led to the charges in this case. The appellant's primary argument appears to be that the department didn't allege the right facts to support the charge. He contends that the department needed to allege that the appellant conducted an eye examination on patient NP pursuant to the free eye exam for glasses option on the intake form and then charge the patient for that exam for discipline to be imposed. But this scenario is not the basis for the charges here. It's instead the appellant's defense, which was not successful. The fact that there were numerous options for patients to choose from on the intake form does not negate the false nature of the advertisement. Patient NP came in for a free eye exam for glasses and he was then charged for an exam. The advertising was plainly deceptive. The appellant also argues that he could not properly defend the charge because the department did not specifically allege that the eye examination offered in the ad was a comprehensive eye examination. However, it is clear that one seeking an eye examination by an eye doctor assumes that a prescription would result if that eye examination revealed vision problems. Additionally, it's clear that the appellant knew this as he testified on page 122 of the transcript that there was no free eye exam for glasses. Instead, it was merely a screening or a consultation. Further, the language of the advertisement, which stated free eye examination for glasses, further buttresses this argument 
that a patient who goes in seeking a free eye examination for glasses would then receive a prescription and no charge for that eye examination. Because the department was able to show with clear and convincing evidence that the advertisement was deceptive, this court should affirm the final order. Turning to the second argument, the administrative law judge did not impermissibly stack inferences. The inference at issue that the utilization and benefit summaries could not have been shown to the patient on the date alleged because the date on the documents was months after the patient's appointment is not a stacked inference. The ALJ made this determination based upon the date on the documents. The only evidence countering this date was given by one of the appellant's witnesses, one of his employees. And the ALJ found that this employee's testimony was not credible. Additionally, even if this was an impermissible inference, any error was harmless. Whether the appellant staff told the patient what his insurance would cover does not negate the fact that he came in for a free eye exam and was then charged a fee. Because it is clear that the appellant advertised free eye examination, examinations and then charged a patient for such an examination upon his arrival, this final order should be affirmed. If your honors have no further questions, thank you. I don't see any, thank you, counsel. Give me a moment, Mr. Belcher, to adjust the clock. Okay, we're at zeros. You may begin, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, during my initial presentation, I did not address the second issue, so I will do that now briefly. Uh, <clears throat> our argument is that uh, inferences that were made from undisputed exhibits uh, that neither party uh, addressed at the evidentiary hearing are improper by the administrative law judge uh, because there may be other reasonable explanations uh, for what the administrative law judge ultimately concluded. The conclusion by the administrative law judge was that uh, a, an a printout from the patient's vision plan uh, was not printed until December 3 of 2012, which was two months after the patient's visit to Dr. Evans. And therefore, this document could not have existed at the time of the patient's visit. Again, this was not an issue that was raised during the trial. This was an inference, two inferences, we argue, that the administrative law judge made after the fact. And our contention is uh, that harms Dr. Evans because he never had the opportunity to rebut these inferences or explain why this date was at the top of this document. Now, this document, again, was an undisputed exhibit and was part of the patient's medical records that Dr. Evans provided to the investigators when the initial complaint was made in December of 2012. So we contend that it was unfair for the administrative law judge and more than unfair due process violation to make these inferences without giving Dr. Evans a chance to address what became a significant issue, not only on these documents, but for any credibility determinations that happened during the trial, uh, because the obvious appearance is that Dr. Evans uh, tried to create documents to give uh, to the investigators. We don't know whether or not that's true. It was never addressed by anyone. For the uh, rest of our issues, uh, back on issue number one, we would rest on our briefs and we would ask that you uh, reverse the final order, remand for uh, the department to amend the administrative complaint and a new evidentiary hearing. Uh, thank you and uh, goodbye from Fort Myers, Judge Casanova. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you both. Stay well. Bye-bye. For well. those of us, the, the bye court bye. staff that are listening in, this will uh, conclude our oral argument. We are in adjournment. Bye-bye. Bye now.